Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good? Good, good. Man, it's a great day to worship. I guess probably every day is, but, you know, it is nice to come together and um, acknowledge the work God is doing. You know, it was, uh, you know, some of you may not know this, but we don't, uh, like, with the worship team and myself, you know, we don't, like, sit together in, a, in a, like, a meeting and decide what songs will be when and that kind of thing. You know, I believe that those are gifted and enabled by God to lead us in worship, have discernment. And so we're always fascinated when we talk together after service at the song selection and how it is so often synchronized with the message. Because like I say, we, we, I don't have a problem with you know, kind of coordinating. We just have never decided that was the way we'd go about it. So today we're going to be looking in the book of Joel. And Joel talks about some very challenges, some in, intense times. And I'm sitting there worshiping and just thinking, man, I'm so glad I told them. But I never told them. You know, they're just, they, God just spoke to them about what's going down and what's happening. So, but before we dig into that, I want to welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming together. Thanks for joining. Uh, it's been an exciting year. It's one you won't forget. You know, right? I, I agreed. There's nothing boring about 2020. That's for sure. Um, we're experiencing things that we, we just never thought would happen. Right? I mean, you could print today's real life headlines, go back two years, and the National Enquirer wouldn't accept it. It would be too ludicrous. All oh, that. There's no way we couldn't even fabricate something. And we're living this craziness. And what I'm finding is uh, it's a great opportunity to live out the love you've been given, to let what God has given you, the love he's shown you, let it be seen, because we live in a world that really is confused and searching. And so thank you for coming together to worship, to be refreshed. Thank you for uh, plugging in. I want to encourage you to get connected, now stay connected, really, those online, uh, those of you here on site, of course, you know, Find out, figure out what works for you to stay connected. You know, we offer certain ways, you know, through digital, through Facebook, through the different, you know, avenues and media that we have. But we just, we offer that because it's the individual who takes hold of that and realizes, hey, I'm going to call my friend. I'm going to connect with this person. I'm going I'm to stay connected. You think it would be automatic. You think it would be easy to stay connected. But you notice it's not easy to stay connected. It's actually kind of a challenge at times. So anyway, not only that, I would encourage you to, uh, to stay involved, get involved. You know, we'll have a children's ministry service next, uh, next service. We do adults basically first service and then children's ministry and adults second service, youth group and everything second service. And there's ways to get involved, to help there, support in that work that's taking place. We're glad to be able to provide two services. We're glad to be able to, uh, you know, share the truth with our kids. We're glad to see people on the team wanting to do that, wanting to go in and, and teach the kids or prepare crafts or work with the games. I mean, it's exciting to see what's happening because it's, it's something that God is continuing to, to knit together and keep together. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be in um, the book of Joel. And then I'm going to, what I would like to do is give a little intro to that and then pray. And I think you'll see the relevance when, uh, for the timing of that uh, as I do that. So Thank you for staying connected. Thank you for going to be participating financially, prayerfully, uh, in every aspect. Let's look at the Word. The Bible is compiled and assembled into two sections, if you would. We know it to be the Old Testament and the New Testament. So within these two sections, it's just a way to see how it's assembled, if you would. You know, there's in the Old Testament, there's different... Literary styles, if you would. You, the first five books we know are from Moses. They have a lot of history, of course, within them. We see uh, God's record of creation as is relevant to humanity. Um, we see these historical books following that as well, uh, followed by Psalms and prophet poetry, um, different types of literature. Now, I mentioned that because a type of literature affects the interpretation of the literature. So if something is poetic in type, you would read it with that knowledge. You wouldn't take it as literal as you would say something that's historical. And so it, it, it helps. Does that make sense? It helps to understand as you're reading the Bible. We make an emphasis here for over 20 years now. Our emphasis has been to teach the Word of God. 
Because we believe that the word of God reveals the nature of God, reveals the condition of humanity and the solution that God has for every one of us. And we believe that some of you will be here for a, a few months or a few years, and then if you're in the military, you're on with the next leg of your journey. And you're just going to be here a little while, even civilians. And so we believe our responsibility is to present to you the truth of Scripture, the Word of God, to encourage you to even generate a bit of a, an appetite within you that you yourself will continue to dig in and, and go along. So that's why I love being able to explain these basic things, the, the types of, of literature we find within the Bible. We have also, as you consider, there's poetry, there's prophets. Prophets are ones who would speak the Word of God. They'd bring forth the Word of God, so they'd be foretelling, but they also would foretell. In other words, they would speak of a time to come, prophetically we call this. Like they're telling of things that are going to take place to generate or to bring a response by the individuals and by the nation, usually Israel. Well, the prophets, the letters that we have there, are broken up into two sections, you know, in a order, so to speak. There's the major and the minor prophets. You know, it's not by length of letter, or actually, like, technically, it is by length of letter, not content. In other words, when you read a minor prophet, you're like, oh, that's just a minor point. No, 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 that's not it. It's just that Isaiah and, and you know, uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, there's, there's more content there volume wise but it's not of more importance does that make sense because sometimes when we see something smaller like oh yeah you know i'm not wired that way i'm wired the other way i see isaiah and go oh man that's gonna take a while oh there's joel i can do that it's only three chapters it's not that lengthy one so that's just my natural disposition we're gonna look in the book of joel today so you have ways you can remember the Bible, the order. You can do it yourself, just kind of figure out how it, how it works. But I have, you know, this thought that, is Jerry lamenting easy Daniel? Anybody get it? Okay, so that's your order. Now it brings you to Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. And then you have Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, have, I have a song for it. That's how I remember it. But as you were at Daniel, keep going to the right. You're going to find Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Now, if you have a phone or a digital device, it's pretty easy. But for those of us who are paper school, old school, we're in Joel. Joel, there's very little known about Joel or his dad. His dad is mentioned in verse 1. Reliable scholars place the writing around 835 B.C. It's during the time of the divided kingdoms, when, when after King Solomon, um, the, the kingdom split. Imagine this, people within a nation divided into two camps. Glad that doesn't happen anymore. That's good to know. It was so intense of a division that they actually fought with each other and established separate nations functionally, Judah and Israel. And so this writing by Joel would be what they would call pre-exile or pre-exilic, meaning prior to the exile when, when the nation would be taken into exile because of the disobedience by the Assyrians and then, of course, the Babylonians. This place is Joel, right? Joel's writings is one of the earliest among the prophets, a contemporary of the prophet Elisha. Remember Elijah and then Elisha. The book of Joel is about hardships, hope, repentance, and judgment. Chapter 1, it addresses a natural disaster, so to speak. We'll read the entire chapter today, but I want to touch on a few things. This natural disaster was locusts by the hundreds of thousands have invaded the land. They've, t they've taken over, if you would, and just, just tore it up. Anybody, does that happen today? If you watch the news, yeah, yeah in East Africa, uh, parts of Asia, India, you know, they're just, it's, a, it's, an, it's you can watch them. I watched a video on them, I'm like, okay, what's it, we're, this is our culture. We can just, well, I read about it, now I'm going to go watch it. So I watch these things, these little four inch or so, different variation, these locusts, they're, it's amazing. 
They just, they darken the sky. Seriously. They're so thick and in such number. And they eat everything inside. They leave nothing. It looks like a fire went through when they're done. They just, they just destroy a path. Some of them up to 90 miles wide. Like, oh my gosh, that's a huge thing. We'll bring up a quote here from Warren Wiersbe. Because Joel brings God's word to the current situation. The current situation in, in Israel and Judah at that time. Uh, let me just read to you the quote. Too often we drift along from day to day, taking our blessings for granted, until God permits a natural calamity to occur and remind us of our total dependence upon him. Let me read that one more time. Too often we drift along from day to day, taking our blessings for granted until God permits a natural calamity to occur and remind us of our total dependence upon him. Sound like today? We go along, things are going okay, and then things are 2020 starts happening. And, and then all of a sudden we say, man, we start realizing we can't fix this. We can't change this. We can, we're going to have to deal with this. Hold your place on Joel. Turn with me to the left. You're going to go to a, one of the books of history. We're going to go to 2 Chronicles, and, and that's where we're going to pray. But I want you to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 6, beginning in verse 28. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, beginning in verse 28. This is Solomon's prayer, because he's going to be leading the nation in the context and the history of this chapter. It's his prayer led by the Holy Spirit, and verbalized through the man Solomon. So this is God's prayer through Solomon for the nation. When there is a famine in the land, pestilence or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, when their enemies besiege them in the land of their cities, whatever plague or sickness, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people Israel, when each one knows his own burden and his own grief and spreads out his hands to this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and give according to all your way, all his ways whose heart you know. For you alone know the hearts of the sons of men, for they may fear you, that they may fear you to walk in your ways as long as they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. I would actually like to pray that prayer, the application uh, for us presently. We see prayers that are embedded and they have promises to the initial audience, Israel. But within those promises, those are principles of prayer. There's truths that are there. And within those truths, we have application. So would you join me in prayer? God, as we would consider this passage that speaks of hardship, that speaks of difficult days in our lives, in every generation, there's been difficulty and hardship that have come upon humanity. And so, Lord, your word speaks very clear that not if, but when these things take place, when this happens, Lord, may we as individuals and as a nation, may we allow you to look into our hearts. May we humble ourselves before you, seeing you as our provider, our physician, our healer, our protector, knowing that you or on the throne, that you lead us, that you love us, and you care for us as, as humanity and as individuals and collections of nations and groups and ethnicities. You know us all, God. And Lord, you say that when these things come upon us, if we would turn to you, if we would make you our focus, our priority, if our heart would find dependence upon you, then you would heal this land. You would heal our hearts. And so, God, we would ask for your work. We ask in regards to this sickness that is upon this, this planet, classified and called a COVID virus. Lord, we pray for your intervention, your healing work. Give us wisdom as individuals, how to navigate life, how to protect ourselves, and yet at the same time find our dependence upon you how to weave our way through the misleading information, how to understand how to love and support and encourage one another. God, lead us, Lord Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord, that you are just, it's just so simple that as we would set our eyes upon you and seek your face, you would show yourself faithful and you would be glorified. And so today, today, Lord, we ask for that to take place more and more. We ask our hearts to be sensitive to you as we would read through your word, as we would take hold of your truth. May we be changed by your presence. May we be transformed by your power, the power that raised you from the dead, the power that lives within us as Christians. May it be manifested in our lives, in our conversation, in the way we engage, in the way we love everyone around us. For your glory and for our joy, we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So now, as you're holding your place there in Joel, let's go back to Joel chapter 1. I'm going to break it up into sections. I'll start with verses 1 through 4. I just want to walk through. I, I thought through the different aspects and, and different parts to this and trying to think how much history do we want to engage and involve. And, and I really want to catch the flow of the letter. I, I believe we're to see it in that sense. And so let's begin in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 4. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has, e swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. What the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. And so here we have very little. We know very little about the person Joel. I want you to take note of that. Some we have more information about. You jump to the New Testament. Peter, we have a lot. Paul, we have quite a bit. But you'll see as you study the Bible, there's a lot of people that are relatively unknown. Unknown to the people of God, well known to the God of the people. See, you individually, we need to realize that he knows us perfectly. Every, every hair or lack of hair on our head, everything about us, he knows us intimately and perfectly and graciously. And so Joel, we, we don't know much about Joel. And I love that. He's a man that God used to, to speak of the situation of the day and what was going down. Even though he, he, there's no bio on him. You know what I'm saying? Is that, is it encouraging to you? It's encouraging to me. That God knows us perfectly, and he knows Joel, and he knows his dad, and, and then there he's right into this here, and it was so important. Hear you elders, and give ear every, all the inhabitants of the land. Hear what? Well, what's a prophet bringing? A prophet is bringing the word of the Lord, bringing God's word into a given situation. And so you're going to be inundated by information. I call it the invasion of information, and that's another message I'm going to deal with. The invasion of information. Because we're stimulated now, and you could track this back, fascinating, uh, Pastor Chuck Smith shared from the late, might have been mid-80s, about how radio had affected conversation. And he's talking about these radio shows like Little Orphan Annie and all these things where they would gather around a radio and listen to the radio. But he was that generation that had conversation and then this infiltration of information, this invasion into the home resulted in changing of the home dynamic. It's not to blame the radio. It's to realize there was a cultural shift back then. How much more would we see it today where the radio doesn't need to invade? The device is in your pocket. The search and the quest and the insatiable appetite for information interferes with conversation. Why do I mention that? Look at what's being said here. This message, that, that to hear and know what God has said, it, it caused them to stop and hear, listen, and share that. See, oral tradition was the way, generally speaking, the, these truths were handed from generation to generation. And it should still be the same. It's one of the things that my wife and I have noticed about living here in the West, being here in Idaho, having the opportunities we've had, we have to sit around a campfire with friends and family members and just you know, people you have history with and to be able to share, oh man, I remember when, and to see our grandkids or to see the younger generation just soaking in the stories, 
hear in those stories about life. See, one of the challenges we have right now generationally in most families, most kids don't know their parents. And quite honestly, many parents, we don't know our kids. We know them from history a decade ago or two decades ago, but we don't know them contemporarily currently because there's been this breakdown. There's this weird thing that happens when there's an exchange of information but lack of conversation. And we should actually, by generation, be handing this off. To what generation? He says, well, tell your children about it. Have you ever seen anything like this? I could pose that as a question today. Has there been any year like this year? Not really, not really. I mean, every year has its own variety, but there really hasn't. As I alluded to, you know, there's just really dumb ideas that are being highly promoted. And that's not because I take one position or another. It's just they lack intelligence. They're full of emotion. They're just dumb. And it's, it's highly promoted. It's like, oh, let's defund the police. Why would you want to do that? Well, because we have too much violence in the land. Eh. What? Where's, where's this going? Oh, well, it's because of this. You know, I'm a data guy. So when somebody jumps on a bandwagon with emotion, I go, what's the data? How many cases of this do we have? How many cases of this? What's the situation? What's the, what's the numbers? Because when you look at the numbers, you come up with a conclusion, right? You, you look at it and go, well, it was this, this, and this. This many times, here's the common denominator. But we don't look at data. We look at emotion. We're driven by all this strange stuff in this world today. And you have to say, man, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like this in the engagement arena. Neither of you. What we're talking about here is an actual historical event in Joel. The locusts had consumed the land. And they were to tell their kids about what happened. Because these natural disasters that have been taking place since the Garden of Eden, these things have been happening. And when they don't affect us, we don't think so much about it. But it's when it affects us, then we think about it. That's just course of human history. Well, these things have been taking place, and God uses these situations to bring about the awareness of his presence and the opportunity for his blessings. And it comes to correction, right? So we see these things. Oh, man. And I hope it continues what we've seen already, people coming to the Lord through our current situation. Because what's happening here, we see that, man, pass this along and tell others about what's going on. Deal with this real-life situation. What the, what the chewing locusts left, the, the swarming locusts is eating, you see what they're talking about, and then scholars have, have you know, discussed this, maybe debated, debated and divided, I don't know. But they've discussed, okay, are they referring to the various stages of a locust? Like when they're hopping, they're eating everything, and then, they, you know. I, I, it, the wording in Hebrew gives leniency to that, but the context seems to say almost waves of mature locusts. Because what one goes through and eats leaves very little for the next one. All right, you kids, think breakfast. Somebody ate the first half of the box of cold cereal. Somebody comes along and eats the next pot, and then you get there, and all you get is sugar dust. And you pour it into your bowl, and you just take what's left. You just take the last of it, and then you blame someone else for eating all the cold cereal. That's kind of one of these, they just, they, the locusts just consumed everything. By the time the last one come through, they're just, they're eating the bark off the trees, stripping the trees to white, which is killing the trees and leaving it literally like a, a, a fire had went through. And that's, you know, that's something that's traceable. Not this particular event. It would be hard to, to pin it down through, you know, archaeology, but just observable even now. It still happens, these type of, of, of events. So this is all taken on the consuming locust. And notice, notice what he said in verse 2 here. Look, listen, be aware of what's happening around you. Now let's carry into verse 5. Awake, you drunkards, and weep. And wail, you drinkers of wine, because of the new, new wine. For it has been cut off from your mouth. There's a lot of discussion, once again, among scholars. Well, what are they talking about? Why do they single out the drunkards specifically? Well, I think to a degree... There is a measure of affluence related to drinking, even in that culture. And, and so when you have excess, you can be excessive. Now, it's obviously not exclusionary in that way. Many people have very little spend all that they have on this particular type of addiction. 
But he's saying, listen, those of you are doing this, guess what? You should be weeping too. Hey, I don't care. It doesn't bother me none. It will in about a week when there's no wine. Because everything's been decimated, the supplies are gone, and you got nothing to drink from, you too should be awakened. Look what's going on, because it's been cut off from your mouth. Verse 6, for a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. There's some discussion, is this, is he now transitioning in his, in, into an allegory or a reference to a coming invasion physically of human, but people? Uh, the context seems to lead us to, uh, it's, it's just continuing to talk about the locusts. It's continuing to speak of the locust because it says that they are strong and without number, the teeth of a lion, if you've looked at the head of a locust. Um, it actually looks kind of like a horse if you kind of scale it down. The Italians have a different word. They call it, um, I, I'm not going to butcher the Italian language. I do enough to the English. But basically they talk about a, a small horse. And then uh, German, I think, can't remember what there there were, but anyway, that's referring to a grasshopper, just mainly because of the head. So here we see this poetic almost description of what it's like. Its fangs are of a fierce lion. He laid waste my vine, my tree, stripped bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. So here he's describing, you know, you you think it's going to get all better once you get sober to the drunkard? No, it isn't. Because look around. It's been decimated. It's been destroyed. This is what's happened in front of your very eyes. Speaking of this devastation caused by the locusts. Verse 8, wail or, or lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Speaking of a, speaking of a, of a woman engaged in our terms to be married, but her husband probably passed away prior to the, the ceremony. And that's what's kind of lamenting. That what kind of wailing is being, mourning is being presented. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The lands mourn for the grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up. The oil fails. Every part of life has been upended and has the appearance of hopelessness. Everything, everything that they would be a part of, even something as simple as being able to offer or engage or do something what would be a religious ceremony or activity in the Jewish culture has been turned over. It can't happen. And so the prophet Joel is bringing that to their attention, making this known. Hey, don't just roll with it. Stop and realize what's taking place. It goes on, we see in, in verse 11, be ashamed, you farmers, Wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley because of the harvest of the field has perished. Well, that seems kind of odd that you'd be ashamed, but the word speaks of to be disappointed, to be confounded, or it really more accurately speaks of be dried up. So think of it this way. The farmer, having no solution for the situation, is feeling a sense of shame. Like, I can't do nothing. I can't provide for my family. There's nothing I can do to remove these locusts or the results of these locusts. In one of the videos I was watching in uh, East Africa, uh, how they're trying to deal with it, there's a guy who was in a village, and, and he just, he's, he's running through this field, waving a, a leaf and scaring them off the ground. There's thousands upon thousands, and he's putting forth some effort. I gotta do something. It, was, it did absolutely nothing beneficial. It, it, there's nothing he could do. There's nothing he could do about this. It, it's, it's crazy to look at. You go, man. But here it says, you know, be, be aware. Be, in the sense that you have no solution for the situation. The vines dried up. The fig trees withered. The pomegranate tree. The palm tree. Apple tree. The trees of the field. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. I, it just doesn't sound like a good time. It just sounds like economic disaster. It sounds like everything that was normal become abnormal. Everything got turned over, uprooted, and was just a mess. Notice now in verse 13, gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Literally, he's telling the priests to prepare yourselves and to mourn. 
Priests are to direct people to God. Priests were to be in touch with real life in God's design. It's religion that separates by apparel and hierarchy the priests from the people. And it ought not be. It's, it's not God's design. Priests, they were impacted by what was happening around them. They were not above the people, but were among the people. Think this way out of Hebrews 4. Jesus, who is, who is what? Our great high priest, who it goes on to say there in chapter 4, was tempted as we are, yet was without sin. So it's kind of what we see about Jesus, which is so unique about him. He's a street-level guy. You know what I'm saying? He, he is God and man and put himself where the rubber meets the road in everyday life. It's what's so fascinating when you study the New Testament and you re read the red letter section, which we recently did a short stretch through. When you see how he engaged with everyday people and we start realizing that's us. That's us. That's who he came to. He tolerated some of the indifferent, antagonistic religious people, even reached out to them. But his focus, if you, if you read the New Testament, you read the Gospels, he went on the street. He talked to the woman at the well. He engaged with the, with the people that were, were sick and hurt and poor and everybody. I mean, it's so fascinating. If we could settle into that, it would change a lot of the problems we have in this world today because it's a matter of the heart. It's not finding what's different and focusing on that. It's just realizing, I'm just going to reach people. I hope you as a Christian have this heart, that you want to connect with the hurting, with the hopeless, with the hungry. You want to connect with those that other people want nothing to do with. Because if you do, you have the heart of Jesus. That was his focus. That was his, that's his, that's his, his, his very desire and drive. So the priests, where they were, they were to be, you know, they were to prepare themselves. They were to seek God. They were to direct people to God. And then they were to lead in humility and repentance before God. See, they were told, you know, here in this, gird yourself and wail. You mourn. You, you, you be aware of the condition of the nation. You be aware of the spirituality and the state of the people. You, you, you be, need to be aware. And I believe that's so important. Now realize that, it's not the pastor that's the priest. That's a different role. It's the born-again Christian that's a priest, that's a representative of the living God. To seek God, to know God, to, to lead people to the love that he would hand to them and make available to them. So be prayerful about that, how we you know, would do it. Because he, he tells them, listen, set aside some time that you're not thinking about eating. Consecrate a fast. Bring the people together. Have a time where you can deal with the issue by devotion to God, by worshiping God. You know, when you come in here, you know, it's, it's actually been an interesting study in my own brain of how things are now versus a year ago. When we come in, we're somewhat subdued. Even though we're smiling, even though we're engaging, even though we know we're going to worship, we're somewhat because of the heaviness of the reality of the world we live in. And when we come in here, it's a, I call it a slow start sometimes. For us to come into this mindset of worship and this awareness of his faithfulness and, and being able to just put all this stuff aside. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard to park the brain in the sense of the distractions so you can make him the number one attraction. It's, it's labor. It's, it's, it's difficult. And it's because of the days we live in. But you, it, the exhortation here is, is that's what you do. We, we, we work through this and we, we come together and you know, we come into the house and we cry out to the Lord. We cry out to the Lord in, in dependence. We cry out to the Lord in devotion, in admiration, in acknowledgement. We cry out to the Lord. The context here speaks of just brokenness and crying out to God. Notice verse 15, alas, for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from Almighty. The day of the Lord here is not speaking of the day of the Lord in chapter 2 in Joel, which we'll get to later, not today. It's a different, the, the day of the Lord here is speaking of, the context gives us the interpretation, is speaking of this 
plague, this situation, this natural disaster, the locust. It goes on to say, it, it, it comes as destruction from the Almighty. Is not the food cut off before our, our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clod. Storehouses are in shambles. Barns are broken down, for the grain has withered. Notice even the animals, how the animals grown. The herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. So the locusts, the famine, enemies, earthquakes. God can use these hardships to remind us that we are completely dependent upon him. He can use, and he does. I see it. That he, he doesn't you know, punish us as some would perceive I, use, I believe in more cases he uses it to awaken us, to remind us that since the Garden of Eden, due to the rebellion of man and mankind telling God, I'll do it my way, I don't want to do it your way, the result of that rebellion was death entered the world. And the consequences continually, generationally, are a direct result of that rebellion. And so when you rebel, there's consequences, agreed? Agreed? There's things that happen, and sometimes it takes a while, but there's just consequences to that. Now, those consequences hopefully can bring you back to an understanding of authority or who, what, you, what, you, what non-rebellious life would look like, which is what I believe these things happen. When these things happen, it's not, oh, those were bad people, so he's burning them. He's, he's flooding them. He's taking away the food. He's bringing about drought. And it can get very complicated if you, if you see things with a, uh, a punishment perspective. I believe God is just saying, hey, I'm going to use this situation to wake you up, to show you that I haven't, av- I haven't abandoned you. I've offered myself to you. And so all these things, I believe, initially are to help us turn to him and recognize our dependence upon him. They're just grasshoppers, man. They're just a bunch of grasshoppers. You know, just kill them. Good luck with that. Something so small, so small changes some hundreds and thousands of people's lives to this day. It's just something little. God can allow something like that even to cause people to see their need for him. Verse 19, oh Lord, to you I cry out. For fire has devoured the open pastures and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you for the water brooks are dried up. And fire has devoured the open pastures. In the midst of calamity, in the days of difficulty, in the hours of hardship, who do we cry out to? Who do we cry out to? I'd like to say as pastor, as soon as this whole COVID thing kicked in, I I just started praying all the time. No, I didn't. I didn't. I like to think I did. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I don't like, engage in activity that I can't pray through. But I, I found myself drawn to information. And, and, and the odd dissemination of that information. And, it's just, I, and I stopped. Whoa, whoa, this, this is just this is contradictory. This is inconclusive. This is misleading. And I found myself humbling myself. Like, God, I'm looking to you. I want to cry out to you for, for protection among family members, for intervention in this situation, and all these different things related to climate. Who do we look to? Who do we cry out to? This chapter leads us to chapter two, but both of them have this theme and thought. Repent. 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 Well, okay, that, is it a church word? I mean, what does repent mean? You don't hear it very often outside of, uh, you know, spiritual, religious conversation, so to speak. So you don't, you don't hear that word very much. Well, repent speaks of, literally, it speaks of to think differently or to change one's mind. So when we're told to repent and turn to Jesus Christ, we're thinking differently about our relationship with the Creator. We're acknowledging that there is one, and we're submitting to the truth He's made known. Repentance is an action and an attitude, an action at conversion because God has made known to you your sins. Repentance is an action and attitude. Now, you repented, you changed your mind because God made known to you your sins, not someone else's sins. He made known to you your sins. And that, that revealing by God was received by you. And then your, your attitude of humility, which means agreeing with God concerning your sins, 
results in this action of repentance. Oh God, I, don't, I turn from that. I, I didn't realize that. I'm still guilty, but I'm sorry. I didn't know I was doing it. Oh Lord, show me how to live. That's a, you see what happens? God reveals the, now, the, the personal sin and then leads you in a way to, to acknowledge it, agree with it, repent, to turn, to change your mind about your own condition, your state. What's important is the attitude of humility before God and submission to God will continue to produce an action of repentance. Here's where many make a mistake. They think of repentance as a past event at the moment of conversion. It was. But repentance is not just an act at conversion. It's an ongoing action and attitude for one who was born again. We continue to repent. If you have this last week, last month, last year, have you said in any way, Lord, I, 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 I changed my mind about that. I used to think that was okay to carry on that way or to speak that way. But in light of your word, I agree with you. No, it's not the right way to do it. I changed my mind. You just repented. Because the attitude of repentance resides in a born-again Christian because the Holy Spirit reveals to you what Jesus said. He brings conviction and truth into your life to build you up and encourage you. And so as he's doing that, we're like, oh, sometimes we feel bad, right? Like, oh, man, I can't believe I'm so dumb. How come it takes me so long to learn this stuff? That's just you. That's not the Lord. The Lord's not saying that to you. You're saying that to you. The Lord's saying, listen, I, I'm showing you this because I want you freed from it. I want you released from it. I want you to understand what I have for your life. Change your mind about these things, about money, about vocabulary, about profanity, about lifestyle. Change your mind because that's what's being said here. Repent. Return from that and turn to him. This has been a really bizarre year, to say the least, and I'm going to give you something that's not to meant to be an all-inclusive, only do this and everything gets better and we live happily ever after. I believe this is a big issue right now. The biggest issue of this year so far have been virus, variation, and vision. Let me explain. Virus. Something so small yet capable of crippling a continent, a, 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 multiple continents. In time of crisis, the natural man in his stubbornness will be busy about repairing when they should be repenting. Trying to fix something they can't fix anyway. And it's in our heart. We want to help. It's not like we're evil. Oh, I don't, I don't care about people. No, we're thinking, what can we do? Let's do something. It's like running around a bunch of locusts with a badminton racket. You're losing. It isn't, it is not, it's not as wasted effort. Analyzing and strategizing when we should be repenting and surrendering. See, this, this, this microscopic virus has people doing all kinds of things that just don't line up for, 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 for a solution. They give us clear, clear our conscience and have a sense of, we, I did something, but, but it doesn't solve it. So we have virus, we have variation. And I know this is, it just think about this. We have variation in our world, humanity. Specifically, people, generally, we're the same. Agreed? Generally, we're the same. Look around. You're, you're generally the same. Heads on top, feet are on the bottom. Pretty much basic. Arms coming out the side for the most part. So it's pretty much that's kind of humanity. And that's not just a physical thing. But generally, we're, we're the same, but with various expressions. And what we're facing in the world today, color is the, is the focus. Everyone I know, and I'm including every one of you here and online, everyone I know dislikes someone because of differences, because of variation. The difference may be visual, it may be philosophical, it may be doctrinal, it may be economic, it may be vocational, it may be relational, it may be ethical, it may be moral. There's variation among us. And the truth of the matter is, whether we consciously admit it, some people we don't like very well because of those differences. The question is, can you receive reasonable variation? Can you receive reasonable variation among humanity? See, it leads to the third part. Virus, variation, and vision. How you see life, how you see people, 
what you hold as a worldview. See, that's a vision. That's how I describe it. How you see things. What do you process things? The issue is not what you see with your eyes, the color of someone's skin. The issue is what's in your heart. The matter, it's a matter of the heart, not of the eyes. And that's why we're in such turmoil right now, I believe, because we, we're only seeing things we want to see. We're stirred by emotion and drawn by agendas. And we don't realize it. You know, there's a need for true spiritual growth in humility, in turning to God. And it just breaks my heart to see our nation being torn apart by things that can be easily resolved and actually create a, a greater complexity, a tighter community, but instead, emotions are driving. Let me just say it this way. The sad truth of racial discrimination is actually promoted and fueled by a, a malicious group. Malicious means intent to do harm. The group has a profound truthful name. You can't deny it. Black Lives Matter. It's very specific. It's a very profound truth. It stands alone. The title uh, in and of itself is, is deeply stirring. But it has thousands of people rallying around the title while promoting disorder and upheaval. Because the title says something that stirs people. And I would just say, in this area, and in many areas, be cautious about who you claim allegiance with. I believe that we should, once again, take hold of the truth of the Scripture. Where it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, that we are all one in Christ. There is variation, but there is no difference in the eyes of God. Does that make sense? There has to be variation. The last thing the world needs is two of me or three of you. Right? I mean, one's enough. We want, we, we want variation. We want to learn from one another. We've just got to get our eyes back on the Lord and stop looking at, the, at, at the, the wrong things. Will you close with me in Acts chapter 3, verse 19? Acts chapter 3, verse 19. The Apostle Paul. Or actually, this is Peter. He's dealing with some things that have come about and he's excited that the Lord has risen, the church is growing, the Spirit, Holy Spirit has been is filled and, and dwelling within them and leading them. But look at this beautiful, powerful passage, just one verse. In this exhortation to know your own condition, he says, repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. I believe most of us today have had that experience. But notice this next ongoing part, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Did you catch that? Do you need refresh? Do we need to reset? Do we need to repent? Yes, we do. But where's it come from? It comes from the presence of the Lord. God himself is the one that brings that hope. You know, this, our issues, humanity's issues, will not be resolved apart from Jesus Christ. They cannot be. They will not be. He is the savior of humanity, savior to all people. He offers himself that way. And there's no means, there's no manner, there's no way under heaven by which a man can be saved but through the redemptive, perfect, complete work of Jesus Christ. And a relationship with him, that presence with him, that's where the times of refreshing comes from. You still have locusts eating lunch. You still have all this stuff around you, but guess what? You have this relationship with Christ that carries you through. I want to have the worship team come up. i got to close it up. Come on, you got to admit, we just covered a whole chapter in the Old Testament. That's pretty good, right? I mean, we, we knocked out a whole chapter, you know? Don't hold me to it for next week. It's too long of a chapter, but, you know. I love being able to teach the word. Maybe you pick up on that. I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of or shy about addressing difficult issues, but let me make sure you understand this. I'm not the authority. I have an opinion. I have a perspective, and I respect yours as yours is different. I had a great conversation last week with somebody that I completely disagree with on major issues, but it was a great conversation because we just agreed to disagree. We both love the Lord. It, 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 it was not a problem. We just realize we don't have to push each other's buttons. We don't have to change each other to be a little mini-me. We just have to believe that God is on the throne and he's going to work out these issues of life. 
If he's glorified, man will be unified. Truthfully. Let's pray. God, wow, so much. So much on our hearts in this room today. So many things. We, we are here with our inner thoughts, with agreement and disagreement. We, we, we don't understand each other, but yet then we do. And Oh, Lord, you know us, and you saved us. You offered life to us. Thank you, Jesus, that you've called us as your children. You've knit us together. If you're here today and you, or you listen to this message, you're, you haven't taken that first step, I, I'm just going to keep it real straightforward for you. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. Not just the knowledge of a religious figure. You need salvation. Your church attendance means nothing. Your giving, your, what you do is nothing in comparison to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Repent. Turn to him. Change your mind about how you will be forgiven. Embrace. Take hold of. Believe what he said to you. Whoever believes on me will not perish, but have everlasting life. He is the Savior of the world. Put your trust in him and turn from the way you used to live. Turn to him, believing by faith that he will teach you what this new life is about. God, we do thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. We rejoice in your goodness. Keep us close to one another that we would glorify you and know your joy in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.